morning. Good morning. Tomorrow begins my last week of class up at Princeton. And before I graduate, I'm supposed to preach a final sermon that is videotaped and evaluated by both my ministry supervisors and the congregation that I have been privileged to serve this year. So if all goes well, and I speak clearly and receive positive evaluations, then I will receive my diploma, get married, move to a new city, and begin a new life. <laughs> and if I receive poor or negative evaluations, I won't graduate. I've wasted three years of my precious youth, and my life is pretty much over. <laughs> so, no pressure. No pressure. Uh, no, it's not, it's not quite that serious. Um, but I have chosen to give a sermon that could make or break my career by preaching at a UU church on the totally uncontroversial topics of death, sin, and life. Raise your hand if you saw that topic coming this morning. <laughs> so this year my ethics course was titled Resisting and Accepting Death and Dying. And I have a very strange assignment that's due tomorrow uh, where I was supposed to fill out a living will and an advanced directive in case I am suddenly seriously hospitalized. And I'm also to write out my own funeral service <laughs> with requests to my surviving family and friends. So for all young seminarians, this is a bizarre task, and I had the added challenge of working on it while simultaneously writing out mine and KP's order of our service for our wedding. <laughs> and it is very surreal to plan both your wedding and your funeral <laughs> at the same time. And I kid you not, the conversation I had with KP took a hard turn from, okay, so we'll read Psalm 103, we'll be pronounced married, we'll kiss, we'll exit to procession from the organ, come thou fount of every blessing, we'll start our new life together. By the way, when I die, <laughs> if you could also read Psalm 103, but instead play some Buddy Holly or Don McLean American Pie, it's non-traditional for a funeral, but I think it'll help everyone with the grief. <laughs> Needless to say, KP was not real happy about that segue. And that's, that's totally understandable. Um, she doesn't want to think about death, my death. I don't want to think about it. I'm trying to live life and that's hard enough. To be making plans for applying to jobs and looking for places to live. I have to do all that and think about what kind of flowers I want on my casket and whether or not it's going to be parallel or perpendicular. That's a lot and it makes my heart race just thinking about it. Because I'm scared to die. And that's the truth. And our culture epitomizes that slogan, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> but the real truth is that everyone here is going to pass away from this earth. And we all have an expiration date. For the fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. Kohelet, the writer of Ecclesiastes, tells us death is an inevitable part of life. And no one can live in this world forever. It says all go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. So why do we not acknowledge that reality in a way that helps me, one, complete my assignment, and two, doesn't cause me heart palpitations? Because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it in church. We don't want to think about it. We worry that to accept it, maybe, is to give up on our living and breathing vitality. But I wonder, though, if maybe we make the mistake of viewing our deaths as only the end of our life, rather than just the next part of it. I always look for hope, and it seems too simple an analogy to say that the polar opposite of life is death, because that puts death on the same plane as life, makes them equal, and I don't believe that to be so. Life is miraculous. Life is creative, gorgeously constructed, infinitely wondrous, unlimitedly precious. And death is a concept, is a state, is an entity. Death could not exist without life. It's like a shadow. So when you stand in the sunlight on a bright April Sunday and your shadow falls on the ground, you can see it. You can see its effects, but you can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't experience it. It's real, it's true, it's a fact. But it's only so because the sun and your body and your life are also real, true, and fact. Life is a positive, creative force, and the death of every one of us 
cannot erase the reality nor the memory of what we accomplish in our time on this earth. It simply cannot. It's not that powerful to be able to undo the energy of our bodies and our souls acting out in love and beauty and the poetic motion of relationships with other living things. The ghostly shadow of death cannot overcome the incredible spirit of life. And with that hopeful thought, I actually had a lot of fun planning my own funeral. You're all invited, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> to think about what happens to us after we die, and if possible, what we want to happen to us running up to it. It should be a necessary part of life. And I think it deserves as much consideration as does my thinking about new apartments and new jobs. The sacred text reads, For all have the same breath, and all shall return to dust. So I saw that there is nothing better than that all should enjoy their work, for that is their lot. The writer says, everyone dies, they have a breath and they lose it. So you should all just enjoy working because that's the hand you were dealt. It's a very humanist verse, isn't it? Weird that it's in the Bible. The Bible. It kind of throws a wrench into all that stuff I just said about death not being worthy of fear, right? Or does it? Two things about this verse. One, the original Hebrew word for breath is ruach, which can also mean spirit or soul. And the word for lot or portion also means an allotment of land or a gift. So we could change the meaning of that dismal sounding text to go something like this. We all have the same spirit that animates us, and we shall all pass away. With this in mind, we should enjoy our work the stuff we do, because that is the gift the Spirit has given to us. The things we do in this life here are gifts. The interconnected web of all existence is a gift. And yes, the returning to, gr to the ground in death is a gift. It is a gift because it is part of our work, part of our entire existence. Life and death wrapped up together. It's all a part of the same thing the holy, the sacred, the spirit of life. And the spirit of this life flows through both our celebrations and our memorials, <laughs> our weddings and our funerals. And I don't know for sure what will happen for me after I breathe my last, but I have hope and I look to Easter and spring that remind me that death and rebirth are forever a part of one another, a natural pair brimming with the holy, the spirit of life. And that's encouraging. Okay, so we got all the way through talking about death. Made no mention of Jesus. Don't worry, he's in here. I know y'all are probably saying, Ken, quit while you're ahead. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about resurrection. Cash in your chips, son. But the title of this sermon is On Sin and Scars. So stay with me. Most of us have heard of sin. The church's language for something that is fundamentally not good. Right? Sin is bad. And while Christians, Muslims, Jews, other theists may disagree what is and what is not a sin, they all agree it's not good. Well, I'm here to argue, unequivocally, that sin is... Well, I mean, it's not good. I think we can all agree on that. Even you use would not say that sin is awesome. But I guess I'm trying to redefine the word sin from the word I grew up with. Theologian Paul Tillich wrote that sin is not an immoral act, and indeed we should never talk about the plural, sins. Here's why. For Tillich, sin was separation from ourselves, from each other, and from God. And the anxiety that we face when dealing with death separates us from ourselves because we become worried that we'll be separated from our very souls, from the spirit of life. And when we fear that our death will separate us from our very souls, we don't always act right, separating us from one another. The state of anxiety is also a separation from our source of ultimate meaning and comfort, our God of many names. So sin is this anxious fear of becoming something fundamentally different after our death, of no longer being us. 
This divided self, that's what I mean when I talk about sin. And it's not awesome. It's not good. It's just not. But this is something I've had a lot of chance to think about as a Christian at a UU church. And this is where my interpretation of the reality of the Easter message in our second reading today really comes in handy to help me talk about life and death. So let me set Luke's gospel scene here. You may have heard of it, you may not. The disciples are sitting around, having a chat. They've heard a rumor from some women that Jesus' tombstone was rolled away and he ain't in there. Because of ancient sexism and the fact that people don't usually rise from the dead, the men discount these rumors. <laughs> Until Jesus is all of a sudden standing next to them. And to the disciples, Jesus was dead. He is dead. He is what death is is. And now he is literally among them. Death is there with them. And they freak out. And so what does Easter Jesus do when his buds are startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost, seeing death? Does he scream, surprise? Or does he play tricks on them or yell, ta-da? No. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I, myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. He does the third most amazing thing in the Bible and says, what are you afraid of? Death? Look, touch, feel, experience. My body is still a body. It has hands, feet. It has scars just as it did in life. I am still me. I am still myself. Death cannot change that. And then he does the second most amazing thing in the Bible. Jesus asks them if they have any snacks. Because he's been gone three days and he needs something to eat. And these men encounter their own worst fears. My worst fears. And they come up against the literal embodiment of their own mortality. And when death speaks to them, it's kind of like life. He wants to comfort them. He wants to eat snacks and hang out. It's like death is just another part of life. And then he does the single most amazing thing in the Bible. To his friends and community, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. And thus it is written, death shall be overcome by the man anointed by the spirit of life, by a God that creates infinitely, loves unconditionally, and comforts universally. Repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed to all nations, beginning right here where we are. The death is not the end you are go to go out and tell people. Tell them to repent. Turn away from the old notion of sins as immoral acts and death being the very opposite of life. Tell them they are forgiven for thinking that they aren't good because they are good, very good. Genesis 1. The only thing in the entire Bible called very good is humanity living in stewardship of the entire world, taking care of the earth and taking care of each other. Humanity is not hopelessly condemned by sinfulness, but is instead very good. The danger of sin is to believe that death is all there is, and that this is all we are. Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, you are witnesses to all these things, to life and death wrapped up together, not as opposites, but as a body in its shadow. One is magnificent and glorious and holy. The other is harmless, weak, dependent. So look at me. Look at my body. See death. Feel it. Experience it. It's not what you think it is. The old ways of understanding don't hold true. Turn away. Sin is forgiven. Separation is healed. Turn away from the old thinking and embrace the new spirit of life that makes us whole. Take comfort in knowing that you are whole and very good. You, Christians, Muslims, Jews, atheists, agnostics, you. 
Science and faith both tell us that we are but stardust, and to stardust we shall return, and that is a beautiful feeling. So because you are good and whole, enjoy your work and your life, for they are gifts. Because you are good and whole, your death is but a small part of your overall existence, and it does not have the power over your spirit. So why are you frightened? Why do you doubt? All go to one place without separation. And there is nothing better than this gift of the spirit that we call life. That is the gift. And in the face of sin that preaches death as scary and final, rejoice in the spirit of life of the Easter and spring seasons when all of creation blooms again in a rebirth that is whole and very good and shows us that death is but a part of life. Rejoice in the weddings and the funerals, for while the pain from losing those we love is inevitable, so is the permanence and the power of our indivisible spirit at work in this world. So may we be bold in planning for life, and practical in planning for death. May we be witnesses of love and spread knowledge of the holy to all corners of the world, starting here. May we forgive ourselves for feeling anxious and separated in the face of death. May we encounter the resurrection of the Christ who overflows with grace and light and breath to say the Spirit is here now. The Holy is here now. Life is here now. The Spirit of life is all-encompassing, moving through breath and death. And nothing can separate our true selves or our works of God's love in the life of this beloved community. Amen.